Hello, everyone, students and teachers across Washington State. My name is Monica Blanchard. I'm a fisheries biologist that focuses on lamprey, and I work for the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife Service, um, as well, the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, as well as the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, it's a joint position, so I'm actually I'm with both agencies, which is very lucky for me. I'm also coming to you today from the ancestral lands of the Cowlitz Indian tribe. Historically, the Cowlitz fished for salmon, steelhead, sturgeon, smelt, and lamprey in the Columbia River and its tributaries. Uh, and today they are uh, leaders and partners in restoration and conservation for these species. Um, we have seen declines in all these populations and hopefully through collaboration and their expertise, we can uh, increase the populations for these fish in the lower Columbia. So today I'm going to be talking to you about lamprey. Uh, so lamprey are a native fish to Washington. They live in our freshwater systems as well as our saltwater systems. And so today I'm gonna to be telling you about this fish that uh, many of you maybe haven't heard of, but they are uh, a native fish. So um, they're different from a lot of our other fish species. We're gonna talk about those unique characteristics. We're also gonna talk about just how old they are. Uh, and we're going to be discussing uh, the three species we have here in Washington, as well as digging into the biology and how they affect uh, the freshwater streams that they live in. And this is a picture of two adult Pacific lamprey that you're seeing on the screen right now. So just as a quick introduction, I wanted to tell you a little bit about why I study lamprey and what I did to get here to be a biologist. So I grew up actually in Washington. I lived outside of Seattle and uh, for my entire life, I've loved being out in the forest and walking in streams and snorkeling and looking at fish. Um, so from a pretty young age, I was very interested in biology. And um, when I was a kid, I liked math and science. And so I thought I might want to to be a biologist, um, but there's lots of careers in natural resources. If you are not as uh, fond of math and science, um, we have a lot of people who work on policy and make sure we protect our species. So there's a lot of jobs out there, which are really cool, but I was a little bit more inclined towards science and math. So I went to Western Washington University in Bellingham for my undergraduate work, where I studied freshwater ecology um, and had a very excellent time uh, living up there. And then I um, moved around a bunch doing different uh, fisheries work. So I worked in Alaska, back in Washington, Idaho, or Utah, and um, Oregon, moving all around. Um, and it, what was really amazing to me is I was living in rainforests and in high deserts, and I was seeing the same fish species. They're so adaptable and able to live in so many different environments. It was really incredible. So um, I moved around doing some really cool jobs, and then I ended up getting my master's degree in watershed science and fisheries at Utah State University, and actually studied steelhead uh, in eastern Oregon. And I continued to work in Oregon for several years, and then recently have moved uh, back to working in Washington, which is very exciting. Uh, and over the past several years, I've been really interested in lamprey because there's the mysterious fish. We rarely see them, but they are in many of our streams um, and their populations are declining. So we need to learn more about them because we actually don't know a lot about them, which um, is very exciting as a biologist. So that's a little background on me and how I got here. Uh, and now we're gonna dive into the reason you're all here, um, the exciting and wonderful lamprey. So lamprey are very different from most of our other fish species. Um, to start, here's a picture. We got a Pacific lamprey at the top um, and then American eel, which kind of looks like a lamprey, but turns out they're not very closely related uh, and they're native to the East Coast. Uh, and then we have our Chinook salmon, one of our favorite species here in the Northwest. So what I want to draw your attention to to start um, is the most kind of uh, characteristic uh, thing that we have to define our lamprey is the fact that they do not have a jaw. So they actually are called a jawless fish. And if you'll see on the um, American eel and the Chinook salmon, they have a mouth that can bite just like we do. So all mammals and most fish species have a jaw. However, Pacific lamprey do not. So instead they have this crazy cool sucker disc. Um, so they actually use this to attach to waterfalls and climb them. They use them to hold onto rocks while they're swimming to rest. And they also use it um, for certain species to be parasites on the outside of whales and fish. And so they actually will suction on to their host and then um, draw fluids and blood um, for their food. So pretty neat characteristic that is very different than most other creatures. Uh, the other big characteristic is they don't have paired fins. So when we think of fish, we often think of fins on the side of their body. 
So for our American eel and our Chinook salmon, they have those paired fins. Um, and if you look around it, most of the fish you'll see that you're um, coming across either eating or when you're snorkeling, they're gonna have these paired fins. But our Pacific lamprey don't. They do have dorsal fins or the fins on their back and they have a caudal fin or a tail fin. Additionally, they do not have scales or bones. So they're really different from a lot of our fish. So this puts them in a unique category, um, the jawless fish, which are also, a, it's called the super class of Ignantha. And that includes all hagfish and all lamprey around the world. So this is a picture of a black hagfish uh, that is native in the Pacific Ocean. So they live off the coast of Washington. So these two groups of fish are super old and very different than most other fish we come across um, in, in the world today. So just how old are these fish? So here's a timeline. We've got um, present day on the right side. Um, you'll see that humans evolved very recently. We're newcomers to the earth. So we evolved about 100,000 years ago. Salmon and in fact, eels evolved around 6 million years ago. So they're fairly new as well. Uh, we've got the age of the dinosaurs highlighted in green. Um, and during this time, we had North America breaking off from the supercontinent Pangaea and becoming its own continent about 100,000 years, 100 million years ago. And then we had sturgeon, which are super old fish, evolving around 200 million years ago. Uh, and then we, where would our lamprey fit on this timeline? So it turns out they would not fit on this timeline because we need to go back way further to see where we first got the evolution of lamprey, which is roughly about 450 million years ago. And to give you a little bit more perspective on that, the first trees evolved around 360 million years ago. So the world that the lamprey initially evolved into was very different than today. On land, there was hardly any life. It was mostly mosses. Um, and so it's a totally different world. And they have actually um, survived multiple mass extinction events, at least four, including the mass extinction event that wiped out the dinosaurs and they when they went extinct around 65 million years ago. So they are survivors. They have, uh, they've changed and been able to live um, in this world over a very long period of time. So lamprey today um, look different than some of the lamprey in the past, but actually very similar to other lamprey in the past. Um, but we have about 40 species globally. And it's a mixture of parasitic lamprey and then non-parasitic lamprey, which we'll talk about a little bit more when it comes to our native species. Um, and they live in freshwater, some for their entire life, and others live in freshwater and saltwater. And so here's some um, images of some different lamprey from around the world. On the top, there's Arctic lamprey, lives up in Alaska and off the coast of Russia. Um, in the lower left, we have... Um, we have sea lamprey, which are native on the east coast of this continent, as well as in Europe. And then we have pouched lamprey in the lower right, which is a lamprey that's native in the southern hemisphere in Australia and South America. So here in Washington, we have three species, two of which are anadromous. So anadromous is basically a fish that is hatched in freshwater and then migrates to saltwater for a certain period and then returns to freshwater to spawn. So this is very similar to our um, Pacific salmon and steelhead uh, where they're moving between the freshwater and saltwater systems. So Pacific lamprey are our largest um, and I would argue our most charismatic of the lamprey species. They um, are the ones we've dedicated the most conservation efforts towards and um, research efforts towards where they're kind of the species we have the most information about, even though that is not a ton of information. Um, and they get to be about a pound. They can be about 30 inches in length, 33 at kind of the max. Um, so they can be quite large. Um, and then we have our Western river lamprey, which is a smaller anadromous fish. So still goes out to the ocean, but only goes out for uh, several months. And so they usually stay in the estuaries or near shore environment, whereas the Pacific lamprey are wide ranging in the Pacific ocean. And for our Pacific lamprey, they are ectoparasites. So they are hanging out on the end, on the outside of the whales and other fish species that they use as hosts. And so they're just suction on with that cool sucker mouth um, and feeding off the fluids and blood. The Western River lamprey also attaches to the outside, um, but they take a little bit more of a bite, even though they don't have a, a jaw to bite, they kind of eat the flesh. So they're a slightly different um, parasite, more predatory. And then we have our um, Western Brook lamprey, which are a resident 
fish. So they spend their entire life in the freshwater. Um, so they do not migrate out to the ocean. And they are, uh, they are filter feeders for their entire life when they're actually feeding. So um, for the freshwater stage for our anatomous fish, as well as the um, larval stage when our uh, resident fish are smaller, which will go into the life cycle shortly, um, they all are filter feeders. And so they're just taking sediment and material out of the um, water column, detritus and algae, and they're feeding that. And so they actually are not um, parasites at that stage. And for our residents, they're never parasites. They just evolve straight into adults. They do have that very characteristic sucker mouth, but their teeth are not very defined and they mostly use it for hanging on to rocks in the stream. So for the life cycle, I'm just gonna go over this kind of quickly, but it will, if you've learned about salmon in your classrooms previously, this will look a little bit familiar, but it's also uh, quite a bit different. So eggs start in the gravel and the stream bed. They um, hatch after about two to four weeks into larvae. And these little larvae swim up and then float downstream where they settle into fine substrates. So they like really nice fine material that they can burrow in because they're gonna live in that sediment for roughly three to eight years. And during that time, again, they're filter feeders. So they're just taking material out of the water column and that's how they feed. And then um, at a certain time, they're gonna get environmental cues and physical cues and they're gonna transform into juveniles. So this is the stage where they develop um, their characteristic sucker mouth. And they're also gonna develop an eye. So you can see that pretty big googly eye um, that grows during this transformation process. Then the juveniles are gonna head out to the ocean where they're gonna be those ectoparasites for one to three years. Um, there's been some lamprey that have been out there for longer, but that's kind of the rough estimate we have. This is the part of the life stage we know the least about. Um, even with our salmon, they go out to the ocean and it's a big ocean out there. So trying to find and get information about these fish can be hard. Um, so we don't know as much about this life stage, but they're out there. Um, there's many different fish and whales that they are hosts on and they're uh, traveling far and wide in the Pacific Ocean. Then they start to receive cues uh, and smell their way back to freshwater. They actually are picking up on pheromones or smells that are released from the larvae um, and they migrate back to those areas because it's it, the larvae are basically saying this is a great place to rear and so you want to spawn here. And so they'll migrate back there. Um, they'll actually hold for the winter and they'll kind of hunker down under a boulder or a root wad. Uh, and then they'll make their final migration up into their spawning areas where they'll build their red. Um, they'll actually use their sucker mouth to move gravels and rocks around um, and deposit their eggs. And then much like our Pacific salmon, um, once they've uh, built their red and laid their eggs, they die. For our resident lamprey, they basically skip that juvenile stage and go straight from the larvae filter feeding to an adult, which is non-feeding. So here is a quick video, which hopefully will work okay. This is um, some spawning that's occurring. Um, and these are uh, Western uh, brook lamprey. So they're about six inches long. Um, there's a group of roughly 15 of them and you can see them picking up and moving rocks, um, making way for making it, uh, the area perfect for their red building and their depositing of eggs. So pretty cool critters. So where would we find these in our streams around Washington? Um, so that was Western Brook Lamprey, and they are going to be found in our uh, headwaters. So if you're up in a smaller stream and you're seeing lamprey, most likely it's a Western Brook Lamprey. Um, they can be found in large rivers, but we tend to see them kind of highest in our watersheds. And then we have our Pacific lamprey, which are kind of in between. They live in um, some bigger rivers as well as medium-sized rivers. Um, they have a similar distribution to our steelhead. Um, and so we find them in a, kind of a large variety of rivers. For our Western river lamprey, we have the most questions probably about this species. We don't know much about it, but we do know that they live in kind of the main stems, bigger rivers, um, and, and fairly close to the estuary um, because they are very um, estuary. They, they head out to the estuary when they um, go out to saltwater. But we do see them quite a bit in the Puget Sound um, as well in the Columbia River. So some of our, our bigger systems, um, we have Western River lamprey, which is very exciting. Um, and there is quite a lot of overlap in these distributions. So you could be standing along a river and have all three species present potentially. The range of our Pacific lamprey, um, they historically extended all the way down to um, Mexico, to the northern part of Mexico, Baja, California, and then all the way up the west coast to Alaska, across the Pacific Ocean to Russia and Japan. 
And on this map, you'll see the current distribution in blue and then the historic distribution in red. So you can see there are a lot of areas that we no longer have Pacific lamprey. And a lot of this is due to um, hydropower dams that have been built and have blocked passage. This map is actually pretty similar uh, for our anadromous salmonids, um, including salmon and steelhead, uh, because we have these barriers that they cannot return to the streams um, above those barriers. Lucky for Pacific lamprey though, they do have some ability to get over natural barriers. They are climbing champions. So that really cool sucker mouth that allows them to feed as an ectoparasite also allows them to climb vertical surfaces. So this is a picture of a waterfall in California and you can see all these adult Pacific lamprey returning, um, moving up this waterfall to get to the areas where they want to spawn. And in this particular location, not even steelhead who are known for their very good jumping abilities could get over this barrier barrier, but Pacific lamprey could by climbing, which is pretty incredible. We also, um, this is very helpful because we can build um, these ramps or different structures that allow Pacific lamprey to return over some of the man-made barriers we made like dams. Um, we've done a really good job of trying to get salmon and steelhead over some of these structures by building what we call fishways, which allow passage, but some of those are extremely difficult for lamprey to to maneuver through and, and pass. And so now we build these uh, wetted walls or different structures that just allow lamprey to use their skills of climbing um, to get over them, which is pretty incredible. So here's a quick video again of some Pacific lamprey. Oops, sorry, that's loud. Um, so these are Pacific lamprey returning to uh, a river in California. And so all of those are lamprey. Um, and they're just kind of waiting their turn to climb this barrier. So this is actually a man-made structure here. Um, and usually what will happen is one will kind of figure out the best way and then the others will follow. And you can see they're, they're climbing in the area where it is wet, but not a super fast velocity. So they can just kind of climb up on the side of the stream. And they're, um, this is a little tricky because there's some 90 degree turns and some weird, um, areas between the blocks. So those can be kind of challenging for lamprey, um, but you can see they're, they're moving up this, this area, which is pretty incredible. So some other quick, fast, uh, fun facts about lamprey. Um, they have seven gill slits for gas exchange. So taking oxygen out of the water and then, ex and then letting carbon um, dioxide out. Um, so it's a little different than a lot of our fish. They have a third eye, which actually is a light sensing organ. Um, so it picks up um, light and dark, but it doesn't actually take in visual cues. Um, they are super good at smelling. So they've got this one single nostril and that's how they navigate um, and they communicate. It's a really powerful organ for our Pacific lamprey. And they're very efficient swimmers, but they are not fast. So again, with those fishways can be really challenging because they're not very fast swimmers. Our salmon and steelhead are way faster, um, but they are very efficient. So they don't utilize a lot of energy when they're moving around. There are over 46 species that we've identified that eat Pacific lamprey. Um, so they're very important for the food web. Um, there's marine mammals, there's um, birds, fish, and vertebrates, so many different creatures mow down on our Pacific lamprey. They are very fatty. Um, they are very calorically dense too. So they have by weight three to five times more calories than a um, salmon. So they are very tasty treats for a lot of different creatures. So very important for the food web. And they're in this kind of unique position where they actually also feed on over 32 species that some of those are overlap from the species that feed on them. So out in the ocean, um, where our Pacific lamprey are parasites, they are attached to um, fish and whales. And again, those ectoparasites tend to, um, they are on the outside and they typically do not kill their hosts. They're just using resources and then will drop off. We don't know very much about how often they change hosts and um, how long they stay on them, but they are typically um, non-lethal non to their hosts. So lamprey are also really important for our ecosystems. Um, they bring what we call marine drive nutrients to our streams. So much like our salmon and steelhead, when they leave for the, for the ocean, they're very small. And when they return, they are way bigger. So they're bringing all this nutrients from the ocean back to our freshwater streams, which is really important for the health of our streams. They also, through their burrowing activities as larvae, because they're 
burrowing into those fine sediments. They add oxygen and soften the sediment, which is enhanced then for a lot of other creatures that live along the stream bed, like um, macroinvertebrates or insects that other creatures eat. And then they also, through their filter feeding, they're capturing all that detritus and algae that's in the in the water column and bringing it to the substrate into that bed material. So again, really beneficial for a lot of other creatures that live along the stream bottom. Lamprey are also very um, important to many tribes in the Northwest, especially Pacific lamprey. So um, Pacific lamprey have been harvested um, by a number of different tribes in the Columbia Basin at Willamette Falls, which is shown in the upper left there. Um, so there's still a number of tribes that harvest today there. Um, and basically as the lamprey are congregating and waiting to move up, that's the area that they harvest. So pretty amazing location to go to harvest lamprey. Um, along the California coast, uh, there's a different tactic. So in the lower left, that's a Yurok tribal member who's using an eeling hook. And so they actually are um, looking for lamprey as they're returning um, right at the mouth of the river, so right where the freshwater comes into the ocean. And they're looking for kind of the dark lamprey as they're swimming over the light sand. And they're considered a first food, so a very important food, um, served oftentimes alongside salmon for many of our tribes in the Northwest. Um, and for the Nez Perce, there's an example of a seasonal round. Um, so it shows all the different foods that are harvested across the year. And the Nez Perce ancestral lands are in Eastern Oregon and Eastern Washington and Idaho. And you'll see uh, lamprey are harvested typically around February. Um, so there's not as many other fish in the river, such as salmon and steelhead returning. Um, so they're a great resource in those kind of winter months. And the tribes in the Northwest and along the coast have been um, very important in basically sounding the alarm that um, our lamprey populations are decreasing. They were some of the earliest people to come forward and really um, be concerned about these populations. And since um, the early 90s, there's been efforts to conserve these fish um, led by the tribes um, in the region. And they've been partners and collaborators and leaders in restoration and conservation efforts in a huge way. Um, we have identified the fact that there are rapidly declining populations for Pacific lamprey across the region. So the red areas show locations where lamprey used to be, Pacific lamprey used to be, but are no longer in those areas. Black areas are where we don't have enough data to even assess these populations. And you'll notice for uh, us Washingtonians, the Puget Sound and Olympic Peninsula, we have a lot of questions about those areas. So we need to do a lot more research up there. Most watersheds are orange to yellow, so we have imperiled populations. They have decreased, so we really need to protect them. So um, there's been threats identified in Washington that are affecting our lamprey, and these are really similar to the things that affect our Pacific salmon and steelhead. So stream and floodplain degradation or damage to our streams and floodplains, passage barriers that restrict migration up and downstream, flow um, management and dewatering. So anytime we take water from a stream, it affects the stream um, biota, so the life in the stream. Water quality, temperature and toxins, um, predation, especially from non-native fish, and climate change is gonna change our freshwater systems as well as the ocean where our lamprey live. Um, the one thing that's very different is that we are worried about lack of awareness. Probably many of you on this call have never even heard of lamprey, but I'm sure everyone in this call has heard of salmon. We learn about them a lot in school and for very good reasons. They're very culturally important and we love to eat them. There's lots of reasons to learn about salmon, um, but for our lamprey, we have a challenge because people don't even know about them. Um, and if they do know about them, they think about the Great Lakes where there was an invasion of sea lamprey um, due to man-made causes. We basically connected um, the Atlantic Ocean to the Great Lakes via canal. So a lot of fish species could get up into the Great Lakes that never uh, lived there before. So the sea lamprey there are not native and they have impacted fish. Um, but in their native range where they have co-evolved with other fish species, they don't do the same level of harm. So they're much like our Pacific lamprey where they're parasites and they don't typically kill their hosts. Um, but we have seen a lot of damage by sea lamprey in the Great Lakes where they're not native. So the big difference is Pacific lamprey are native to the West Coast. They've co-evolved with the fish species here and are integral, very linked to the food chain, to the health of the stream. Um, so they are, are a lot different than people think about for sea lamprey. So what can we do to help lamprey? 
Um, first thing you can tell them how awesome they are. You can tell them that they exist. That's a good place to start so that everyone knows that these are fish that are native to our uh, streams here. We have three different species. Um, and also they will not attach to you when you swim. So do not be worried about that. They will not suck your blood. Um, you can also help keep our streams clean um, by making sure we don't get uh, garbage and pollutants into them. Volunteer for a stream restoration project. There's watershed councils and regional fisheries enhancement groups that do um, tree plantings and restoration projects that are super fun to get involved in. Um, and uh, as you may have learned, we have a lot to learn about lamprey. We still have so many questions. So if you're interested in science and in interested in asking questions, I highly encourage you to be a biologist because we have to answer these questions. And so we need you to come and help us. We have to learn about Western River lamprey. We have so many different questions on how we impact lamprey. And again, we don't even know where lamprey are in the Puget Sound. So if you're interested, I will be excited to work with you in the future. Thank you for listening to this talk about lamprey and I look forward to taking your questions. Hey Monica, that was awesome. I learned so much. Thank you. I, I especially loved the videos. Seeing them climb the wall is just, it's amazing. It's really amazing. <laughs> so we do have some questions for you. Um, Cole would like to know what similarities do they have to leeches? So they are very different than leeches. So leeches are an invertebrate. So they're uh, very, 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 very distantly related. I wouldn't even say they're hardly related at all. So they, um, they're not related. Um, they are very different. Leeches um, are more akin to um, like insects uh, that don't have a backbone or don't have a spinal cord. So lamprey are actually closer related to us, even though they're very distantly related to us because they have um, a spinal cord um, or a, a backbone. So we actually have bones. They don't have bones. They actually have cartilage instead of bones, but they have that um, spinal cord, which makes them more closely related to us, whereas leeches are an invertebrate and don't have that. Good to know, because I sort of think of leeches too. And I mean, you think of- uh, Yeah, think yeah. Of the whole attaching <laughs> attaching with the mouth and sucking the blood does, does you know, vampires, leeches, there's a few connections, um, but they're they're pretty different. So the, the ectoparasitic lampreys, are they only eating blood or are they taking other things out of the animal as well? Mostly blood and other fluids. Um, so for our ectoparasites that are um, just latching on and doing and collecting blood and fluid, that's like our Pacific lamprey, our Western river lamprey, they do tend to take more hunks. So they're going to take tissue. Um, so they're a little bit different. They're, they tend to be a little bit more of the predatory. So tissue focused. So we have kind of two differences, but for our Pacific lamprey, that tends to be just blood and kind of body fluids. So before there were modern whales and fish, what did lamprey prey on? Great question. So um, they would have preyed on, they're very flexible with what they, they attach to. Um, and so they would have preyed on anything that they could attach to and basically kind of make that hole. They have like this rasping tongue that actually bores the hole. And then, so anything that they soft-sided and that they could attach to, um, they would. And when they evolved, they evolved during a time when there was a lot of different fish species. So there's actually way more different types of extinct lamprey than there are currently today. Um, during the Devonian age, which is actually called the age of the fishes, um, there was way more different kinds of lamprey. And actually there were some that were armored. Um, so they would have looked really different than our lamprey today that you know don't have scales or anything. They're very smooth. Um, and so they would have probably just been parasites on um, anything that they could attach to. What we found is that um, there are hosts that they're more commonly attached to, um, but there's also, they, they will kind of attach to whatever they can. So I think they would have just figured out what fish um, were swimming around at that time, or, um, you know, potentially even if there was some reptile species, we had a lot more, they, we had swimming reptiles back then, um, dinosaurs, they would have attached to any of, anything that was swimming that was soft enough to the, for them to, to latch onto, I would guess. Whatever's That's a great question. Water whatever's in the water. So you mentioned that lampreys like the brook lamprey are filter feeders. What does that mean? 
So filter feeders, basically um, for lamprey, when they are living in the sediment, they're gonna be burrowed in the sediment and then they're gonna extend their head out and they've got what we call at that stage an oral hood. So they don't have the disc yet. And they're basically gonna be pulling water into their mouth and in the water there's floating particles. So there's detritus, which is like basically um, decaying material. There's algae, there's all sorts of good stuff. And so they're gonna basically pull the water in and they're gonna extract those bits of food from the water. So they just are hanging out, kind of pulling water in their mouth, extracting and pulling out those food pieces. And that's what they eat. And they're not um, very efficient digesters. So then um, a lot of that food ends up just getting right back put into the bed material. Um, and so other creatures can then feed off of it as well. Oh, interesting. Do they fertilize? the soil at all? Or yes, a lot of people kind of equate them to, they, they do fertiliz fertilization, they're kind of like an earthworm because their movement in the stream bed. Um, they've been linked to a lot of really good, healthy processes to make our streams more um, healthy for other species to grow in. That's really cool. Can only tribal members harvest lamprey? Yes, currently only tribal members can harvest lamprey um, in Washington as well as Oregon. Um, and so historically there were actually commercial harvests for lamprey. They were used, um, there was a few different industries that would use them. I, I think it was actually like fish meal. And then there was another thing that I can't remember at the moment, but so we used to have commercial fisheries, um, but those were stopped in light of uh, huge declines in their populations. So we don't have any um, industry that commercially fishes for them um, and our harvest is restricted to tribal members. Can they be aggressive to people? I grew up along the Willapa and saw them frequently. Yes, that is, um, that is a common thought, but it is not true. So when, um, especially in freshwater, so in freshwater, they're either larvae, which are filter feeders. So they're not gonna be um, wanting to attach onto you. And then when they return as adults, the other part of their life cycle, when they're in the freshwater, they're actually not feeding. Their esophagus is actually closed. Um, so they are not gonna be feeding off of you or attaching to you while you're swimming. Totally no worries on that front. There is a chance that if you were to hold a lamprey against your skin, they would just suction on because that's just what they do. They pretty much just suction on to anything that's in front of them. So glass, that's why we get these cool photos of their mouths. When they're moving upstream, they're suctioning on rocks. Um, so they would they would suction on you, but they are not going to burrow in. They're not going to draw your blood. They are not feeding as adults when they return. Um, and in the ocean, you're just not there. They're type of food. Um, you're not swimming around, you're not a fish. Um, so it's very, very, very unlikely they would ever attach to you. And it, by the time they would, you would be able to get them off. They're not going to latch onto you. So um, there's definitely no worries swimming with lamprey. It would just be cool. Um, and so, yeah, it is a, mis a misconception that is not a problem. Can you tell us how the lamprey population in Alaska is doing? Yeah, so we actually, um, I am not an expert when it comes to Alaska, um, but we do have partners we work with up there. And if you have questions, um, Alaska Department of Fish and Game would have a lot of good information. But from what I know, so there's a couple different species of lamprey up there that are different. Um, Arctic lamprey is one of the most popular, most populous species up there. And there actually is a commercial harvest for those fish up on the Yukon River. Um, and so, they're oftentimes used in different places for bait. They're also eaten in different parts of the world. Um, so there is a commercial harvest up there. For Pacific lamprey, um, what I know is that there isn't a ton of data. We have a lot of information gaps. So we have a lot of questions up there. Um, I think most of the information that we know about lamprey in Alaska is Arctic lamprey. Um, but again, I'm not an expert up there. Um, there are a couple other different brook lamprey species. It's a really cool area for lamprey, but um, I think there has been kind of a lot of, we still just have a lot of questions up there. Good to know. Do individuals imprint, imprint on a stream like Sam? Great question. They do not. So this is a big way that um, lamprey are different from our salmon species. So 
they more um, cue in on freshwater signals and smells that are released from the larval lamprey, those pheromones that basically tell the lamprey, hey, this is a good spot. Uh, I'm rearing here. I'm, I'm happy. If you spawn here, your offspring will be happy. So they're cueing in on other lamprey, but they're not necessarily returning to their home streams. Um, so we actually have done some genetic analysis, um, and there are some kind of patches where we see more common genetics um, across the West Coast, but they're also kind of spread all over. So we definitely get lamprey that are, you know, uh, hatched in the Columbia Basin and move up and spawn, uh, you know, somewhere else in, let's say, BC or something. So their genetics are much more spread out um, and not, and, and that's a big part because they don't go back to their home streams which we have a lot of questions on, you know, what are they picking up that's causing them to go to different streams? Is it because their host, you know, swam up and now is in, is in Canada and they've decided they are ready to go back to freshwater. So they drop off and, and just pick up on those freshwater cues um, up there. You know, we have a lot of questions on kind of still why they're going where they're going. Um, but that is a pretty big difference between um, our lamprey, our Pacific lamprey and our Pacific salmon. So. I'm curious to know if we know how far individuals range once they reach the ocean. Have you tagged any to see whether they stick close to home? Great question. So for our Western river lamprey, they do tend to stay um, pretty close to the shore. So um, they're only out for a few months. They kind of go out in the spring, come back in the fall. Um, so they are gonna be near shore and, and really kind of focused on the estuary. We have a lot to learn about them. That's kind of what we think. Um, for our Pacific salmon, they are very wide ranging. So there was one that was tagged up off the coast of Russia, like up in the, like right along the Bering Sea. And it ended up in the Columbia Basin at Bonneville Dam. So it was, it went on a journey. Um, and so they, again, like, you know, are they attached to a host that's swimming up in that way in that region and then comes down here? Um, how many hosts do they have over their life in the ocean? You know, we have a lot of questions, but we do know based on, on that, we don't have a ton of tagged um, fish in the ocean, but we do have that one that was all the way up near Russia and then ended up in Bonneville on the Columbia River. So um, pretty extreme distance. So um, they can go pretty far. Wow. Oh. I'd yeah. like to know, it would be interesting to know what they did on that journey. It's I know, what were you doing, little lamprey? <laughs> like, yeah, who were you attached to and where were you going? And yeah, it's, it's pretty incredible. Where do you recommend I go to try and see Pacific lamprey? That is an excellent question. So there are, um, one, of the, one of the best places um, to go is the um, Oregon Zoo actually has an exhibit with Pacific lamprey in it. And so to get up close and personal to them, once the zoo is open, I, I'm not sure if they've reopened yet, but um, the Oregon Zoo in Portland has an awesome exhibit. So that is really cool because you can, they're right there in the tank and you get to see them up close and it's really awesome. It is Otherwise, very hard to see Pacific lamprey because um, when they're in their larval stage, they're burrowed in the sediment, so tricky to see. <laughs> and when they're adults, they oftentimes are moving at night. So they tend to spawn um, in the spring and into summer. So roughly February, March, and as late as um, July. So during that time frame, depending on where you're at, you can possibly go look at your streams to see if they're spawning. They do, they're typically more active at night. So at night, at, during the day, they'll, they'll kind of hide in some rocks or log jams, hang out, and then they'll do the majority of their work on their reds um, during the night. But there are times when they're active and swimming around during the day as well. So depending on where you're at, you might be able to go walk your streams um, and see them spawning. But they are kind of tricky because we don't see them. And so we kind of don't think about how important they are because we're just not encountering them very often. There are some areas um, where historically we would have gotten huge runs. Um, you know, at Willamette Falls was one place. Um, Kettle Falls is another place that's now inundated. Um, but these big waterfalls, we did tend to see um, lamprey congregating. Another place um, in Washington um, is Rainbow Falls on the Chehalis River. Um, 
from the Chehalis watershed. Um, and so there are some areas where they, we still get lamprey. They're just not congregating in as big of numbers um, because our populations are much lower. Um, so it is unfortunate we don't get to see them very often, but definitely if you ever are in Portland, um, that exhibit is pretty cool. Um, and otherwise I recommend kind of walking your streams. The brook lamprey also, you can see spawning um, in smaller tributaries um, like the video I showed. So especially kind of, you know, like May and June are our best bet for trying to see them while they're spawning. Typically, depends. <laughs> you're on your location. <laughs> depends on where you're at. Yeah. Um, are there any diseases that impact Pacific lamprey? That's a great question. So I am not, um, I'm not that, uh, at, for my background in biology, I'm much more focused on habitat than diseases, but we do check our lamprey um, for diseases if we are, there are diseases they can get um, in aquaculture settings and there's diseases they can get in the wild. Um, I'm not super knowledgeable when it comes to those, but there are um, diseases that affect them that affect other species. Um, and so they, they can get diseases. Um, it's one of the things we don't like to move fish around um, without testing them. Um, so you have to be very careful when you're moving fish between basins, make sure they don't have diseases they can spread. Um, but there are a number of uh, diseases that other fish and lamprey can get. You gotta be kind of careful if you're moving them around, but I don't, I'm not super familiar with the exact diseases, but I can get you that information if you're interested. Thank you. Um, do they, I, I've heard that they latch onto and kill salmon. Is this true? So for our Pacific salmon, Pacific lamprey, sorry. Um, again, they, they, there may be occasions where we don't have great um, numbers on the percent of their hosts that they kill. Typically for parasites, um, they are not intending to kill their host. So parasitoids, those are the critters that like to kill their hosts. Most parasites in the world are not that. Um, actually, parasitism is a very, very prevalent life history strategy. I think it's like 40% of the creatures in the world are parasites because a lot of them we don't think about. Um, but so for ma the majority of parasites, they're not intending to kill their host. Now, there may be cases where a lamprey latches on to a salmon and um, they have reduced fitness and maybe get a, you know, get um, injured to the point where they do die. That definitely could happen. It's probably not that common, but we don't really have information on those numbers. We still have to do a lot of research in that area. Um, but that we see a lot of fish with scars, meaning that they've healed um, and they've still survived. So um, we know that a lot of fish do survive from having Pacific lamprey attached to them. For our Western river lamprey, it's a little bit more complicated because they are taking kind of more of those um, um, the tissue from the uh, different fish. So they might be causing a little bit more of an impact and potentially killing um, their host. But I, I always like to point out, it's so funny because we, we have this uh, reaction when we're thinking about par parasites that really kind of creeps us out. But you, there's all the predators that eat uh, salmon and uh, they eat all of them, you know? And so anything that's going, uh, 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 trying to eat salmon, which is a lot because salmon are super tasty. Um, our orca whales, for example, you know, they're going for salmon and they are going to eat every one that they go for, you know, they're going to kill it. So, um, so it's kind of one of those things that the food web is complicated and there's so many creatures out there that want to eat lamprey. There's so many creatures out there that want to eat schnook and they actually probably um, cause mortalities for each other. So it is a super complicated food web when you add lamprey in there because they're, they're this tasty treat and lots of their species eat them, but also they do cause um, potentially some mortality, some deaths for their host fish. So um, we don't have good numbers, but um, it likely does happen. But for our Pacific lamprey, likely not too many. Got to gotta get your uh, biology degree, <laughs> degree and come out and answer these questions with me. That sounds so fun. Um, we just have time for a couple more uh, questions. Our final two questions is, can you review the predators of lampreys again? Yes, so there are so many. Um, a lot of marine birds will eat them, especially when they're migrating out as juveniles and they're heading out into the ocean. Um, there's cormorants and terns and all sorts of birds that are gonna be just totally chowing down on lamprey. Um, they kind of tend to move out in a pulse um, with high water. And so there, they can, there can be a lot of them. And so they just go to town. Um, marine mammals like to eat them. 
other mammals like otters, river otters. Um, and so there's a ton of different species kind of on um, every part of their life, life cycle. Um, in the ocean, uh, lots of other fish like to eat them. Again, they're so calorically dense and they're not super fast swimmers. So they are primo prey for a lot of uh, fish species. And, um, and then also uh, invertebrates, when the carcasses come back and, uh, or the, the fish come back to spawn and become carcasses, um, there's lots of different invertebrates. So insects in, um, and then also like uh, craw crawfish um, that are going to chew and, and break down those carcasses. So um, kind of from the time they're larvae and they're super tasty treats in the freshwater system and other fish like sculpin are going to eat them too, when they return from um, the ocean, bringing all that marine derived nutrients. And then you've got invertebrates, they're going to break that, break that, um, that nutrients down and make it available for other creatures. So um, tons of different things. I think we, I think it's like, we say roughly 46, but there's probably bunches more. What an important species to their ecosystem. Some yeah, yeah. Depend on. And what's, yeah, totally. What's kind of amazing. So for salmon, um, our, you know, Chinook, our largest salmon, um, they will lay around 5,000 eggs, sometimes more, but like a 5,000 is kind of a good average. And for our Pacific lamprey, they are going to lay 200,000 eggs. So they just have so many eggs and so many offspring, um, likely because they have pretty high mortality rates because they are so tasty. So all these critters are going to be wanting to eat them. Um, and so they are definitely a really important food resource. And historically, when we had these really large populations, um, there would have been tons of lamprey that, that other creatures would have been very excited to eat. Thank you, Monica. Our final question is, do lampreys get parasites themselves? Great question. Um, so they will get um, a special like fungus um, if they have a wound um, because birds will prey, try to prey on them or um, marine mammals. And they, if they get away, a lot of times they'll have scrapes. And so they can get fungus that would um, would cause uh, issues for them, depending on the, the extent they could die. And I'm sure there's other parasites out there that would um, be host uh, that they would be a host for. So that's the uh, cool thing about parasites is there's there's a a lot of them out there and they kind of have all these specialities. They can go for different, different, um, different creatures. So I would not be surprised if there's very specific parasites that go for lamprey. Um, I'm not sure about that as well, but, um, as, as like specific ones, but I would not be surprised. Well, that's awesome. And Monica, I just want to thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today about lamprey. I know I learned a lot and I'm super excited to go be a lamprey advocate. Um, awesome. if, if anyone hasn't um, seen, we did supply um, more lamprey information. It has brook lamprey, Pacific lamprey, some river lamprey information in the Google Docs. There's some great videos in there. Um, one of them is called The Lost Fish, and, it, and it's how the peoples of the Pacific, the indigenous peoples of the Pacific Northwest have really um, existed with this fish since time memorial. And I really encourage folks to watch that. Um, this recording. Um, we are recording and it will be up on YouTube in about a week and we'll put that uh, document with it as well. But thanks everyone so much for attending and thank you Monica again. I hope that you have a great day. Thank you so much for having me and thanks everyone for uh, listening and learning about Lamprey.